you've been watching the past few episodes of History Traveler, you, you know that we've been traveling through Belgium and Germany with four veterans of the Second World War, visiting some of the, the battlefields where they were in 1944 and 1945. And for, for the infantrymen, as they were advancing towards the east in Germany, well, they, they started coming across these, these different concentration camps and started seeing evidence of, of the Holocaust and had what, what had been going on inside of Nazi Germany. One of those men who's with us today, Jack Moran, was in the 87th Infantry Division and actually saw one of those camps as he was moving through. So today, uh, we have some pretty interesting things that we're going to be doing, but we're getting ready to load everybody up in the van and head out to the Buchenwald concentration camp. So we just got here to the Buchenwald concentration camp and uh, the area right here where the, the parking lot now is, is where the SS parade ground was. Uh, so we're going to, to spend some time just kind of doing a, a walkthrough of this camp. We're, we're really limited on time so I don't know how much I'm going to be able to do, uh, but we'll try and give a, a good overview of, uh, of what this camp looked like. So again, the SS parade ground here is going to form kind of the core of the SS area here at Buchenwald. So there would have been uh, 12 barracks for the SS all around this area, kind of in a semicircle. And uh, the men of SS Totenkopf uh, Thuringen Division, I think that's how you say it, or Thuringen Division, were responsible for guarding this camp. So you're looking at a lot of guys who were probably 20 years old or younger. Uh, so Buchenwald gets established in 1937 and by late 1937 there was about 1600 SS men who were stationed here in these barracks and uh, ha had a reputation for doing some awful things. Uh, a lot of them would go on to serve in, in Poland uh, with the, the Wehrmacht when Germany uh, invades Poland. But yeah, this is the SS parade ground. To me, one of the more enduring symbols of the Holocaust is the rail lines and the boxcars that transported people all over the Reich. Uh, here we are looking at the, the rail station that was constructed here at Buchenwald and uh, we'll just take a, a little look around here. Now originally this wasn't here. Uh, there was an armaments factory that was built here at Buchenwald in March of 1943 and then Himmler ordered a rail line to be constructed to serve the armaments factory. Well in addition to serving the armaments factory which is kind of off in the distance there uh, it's no longer here but we'll, we'll take a look at what's left in a, in a little bit but in addition to that it brought people to Buchenwald so standing here uh, it, it's just heartbreaking to imagine the scenes that must have unfolded in this place as people were coming in from the occupied areas uh, that would have been you know suffocating or dying of thirst uh, in, in 1945, you would have had overfilled transports that were coming in from the east as the Soviet army was pushing through and camps were being liquidated. Uh, a lot of the ones who survived were brought here to Buchenwald. Uh, yeah, just absolutely chilling to, to think about the uh, agony that, that must have been endured by people right here. Now, I mentioned the armaments factory just a minute ago, and there on that sign we can see a picture of what would have been right here 
in this spot. So the armaments factory, I think, started construction in late 1942 and finished uh, like March of 1943. And uh, there were 13 different uh, production halls that that workers uh, constructed gun parts and assembled rifles and produced artillery components and constructed mechanics for rockets. Uh, so, so you would have had the inmate population being mobilized to basically build weapons for their enemies. Uh, you About 3,000 uh, inmates worked here, so you're looking at a lot of Russians and French and Poles. And uh, I'm going to take a little walk back here. And... Hmm. I don't know if we're looking at bomb craters or, or what right now. Uh, the the factory, uh, or the whole complex here, was uh, attacked by Allied bombers in August of 1944. And the, the factory was almost completely destroyed. And, and unfortunately uh, killed some people in the process. Over 300 people were killed and over 500 injured. All right, uh, looks like we have a, a little bit better uh, piece of the foundation here, a more complete piece. Uh, after the, the bombing in August of 44, uh, they only were able to partially resume production. Uh, so the, the bombing pretty much knocked this place out. Right now, I'm walking towards the interior of the camp on uh, a thing called the Caraco Path, which basically was kind of like the, the final gauntlet before the inmates of Buchenwald got into the camp. All right, the uh, path that I'm walking down right now, uh, as I mentioned, is called the Caracho Path. Caracho kind of means like uh, with, with gusto. And this is a name that was intentionally chosen by the SS with kind of a, a cynical intent. So inmates would have been like running down here. And like I said, they're kind of running through a gauntlet. They're being hounded by dogs and they're being beaten and harassed. And, and this was going to be the beginning of a terrible ordeal for the people here at Buchenwald. So what we are looking at here is the remnants of the camp headquarters. So this is where the camp commandant would have stayed and would have been making all of the major decisions. Uh, the first commandant of uh, Buchenwald was a man named Carl Koch, who was just a, a sadistic, evil man. And, and so was his wife, Ilsa Koch. Uh, here we can see what the building uh, originally looked like in its complete form. Uh, as I said, we're, we only see like the middle portion or what's left of it right here. And then this over here is um, the political division. Uh, so this is where the central office of the Gestapo would have been. So uh, inmates would have been photographed here in this building prior to going through the gates into Buchenwald. Man, standing here in front of this gate, you cannot help but think and and feel the, the terror that the inmates of Buchenwald must have felt before going into this awful place. Uh, so here on either side of the, the gatehouse are these detention centers where all kinds of horrible things happened. There was imprisonment, beatings, and, and torture. And... Uh, this, this gatehouse sits prominently over the entire camp. So there would have been floodlights here uh, that would have covered the whole camp. Uh, there, there would have been a loudspeaker where the SS would have made announcements. And on the gate are the words that in English translate to, to each his own. 
I mentioned earlier how, to me, one of the enduring symbols of the Holocaust was the, the trains and the rail cars. Uh, another thing that I think is symbolic of the Holocaust is barbed wire. So before we go in, I wanted to walk the perimeter here and, and actually show something else. Uh, Buchenwald had about 3,500 meters of electric barbed wire fence that basically kept the prisoners in. Uh, all total, there's going to be over 275,000 prisoners who are going to pass through here. And of that, 56,000 are going to die. Here at Buchenwald, they have something that honestly just borders on the bizarre to me. Uh, there is a small zoo park here where they had brown bears and monkeys and, and deer. And of the concentration camps that I've been to, I, like the, there's just something deeply cynical uh, about this. Uh, that, that you have this zoo where the animals are more well cared for than the inmates uh, sitting right here within sight of the crematorium. Just, yeah, again, uh, kind of a, a bizarre thing that, that they did here and, and deeply sad. We've now moved inside the wire here at Buchenwald and we are standing in the roll call square. So I, I want you to imagine for a moment standing here whether it's in the hot sun or in the freezing cold and you are standing here with thousands of other inmates. Uh, you've got the watchtowers all around that are you know, maybe running floodlights through if it's dark. Uh, there's loudspeakers that are blaring, and you have guards all over the place that are shouting at you. And, and day after day, you have to line up in this place and be counted and subjected to all kinds of uh, abuse. Uh, roll call would be twice a day. Uh, sometimes it would last for like 72 hours. And here you can see a photo of just all of these people packed in to, to this area. Uh, they would also have a beating rack here where they would whip inmates. Uh, there was gallows that erect, were erected here uh, where, where inmates were hanged. Uh, just, just unimaginable human suffering here uh, in this place. Absolutely awful. What we are looking at here is a memorial to the Jewish special camp. This was kind of a camp within the camp. Uh, Buchenwald was originally designed for like political prisoners, but after the Jewish pogroms in November of 1938, uh, upwards of 10,000 Jewish individuals were brought and were kept in a second or a separate section here within the camp. Now, obviously, there are no barracks left here in the camp. They were destroyed in the 50s. But, like, right here and, like, uh, right up in here, well, you can see the outlines of where the prisoner barracks were. Uh, so, so this gives us a little bit of an idea of the layout of the barracks here at Buchenwald. And uh, th this camp goes through several evolutions. Uh, you know, there's like the original camp and then more people start to flood in so they have to build more barracks and uh, you, you can see here you know the the different blocks and as you can imagine these are overcrowded and they are uh, unsanitary. Um, there, there would have been like washrooms in some of them but not all of them uh, and yeah, just, just really, really awful and, and disease-ridden. 
I've just moved over one block to block eight. So if you look there in the distance, that was block seven where we were just standing. And uh, this is more towards the interior of the camp. Uh, block eight is exceptionally sad to me. Uh, this was called the, the children's block. So in 1943, there was a lot of displaced youth and children who were brought into the camp and the, the numbers of kids here at Buchenwald was steadily increasing. So the uh, political prisoners wanted to protect them and uh, persuaded the SS to establish this children's block. So there were over 300 youth and children from seven different countries, Jews, Roma, and uh, this is how they were saved here in this camp. So where we are standing right now is the foundations of Block 46. And this, oh, there were some awful things that happened here. Uh, this is where typhus vaccines were tested on the inmates. And here you can see one of the, the reconstructed barracks for the medical facility. Ugh, terrible. Now, as you've already seen, there are several memorials here at Buchenwald. And this one, to me, as far as what I've seen so far, is the most striking. This is a memorial to the, the murdered Sinti and, and Roma. And if we walk up here on each one of these blocks, you can see engraved the name of different concentration camps. So there's Dachau, there's Bergen-Belsen, um, there's Treblinka. Okay, so all of these different camps kind of represented uh, with these stones. And, and, and what the, the Roma uh, had to endure here was absolutely awful. Lots of medical experimentation. Um, but yeah, this, this is a pretty moving memorial. Here's another memorial here at Buchenwald that is is really unique. Uh, this is the Jewish memorial. Uh, it was consecrated on November 9th of 1993, which was the anniversary of Kristallnacht. And uh, this is in the footprint of Barracks 22, which was in one of the, the Jewish blocks. So this honors the memory of the 75,000 Jewish men and women who were interred here at Buchenwald and the nearly 12,000 who were killed. And you can see that, that they've like dug out this hollow place uh, to uh, basically show like the, the absence of, of life. And there's an inscription uh, from Psalms 78.6 that says, so that the generation to come might know the children yet to be born, that they too may rise and declare to their children. One thing that's kind of interesting about Buchenwald is that it wasn't just Soviet prisoners and uh, Roma and political prisoners that were here. 
there were also some American airmen who spent some time here at Buchenwald. Now, the, the reasons why they were brought here is a little bit hazy. Some think it's because they went down in France and were captured in civilian clothing. But they have a memorial here to the airmen. And uh, now there's something pretty special that uh, they're going to have Bud do here. I didn't even know airmen were buried here or killed here. I've heard about the Holocaust for years and years and years, but reality happened today. I actually, I'm emotional. I'm emotional. I can't believe that man's inhumanity to man could have been this severe. And uh, I pray to God and I thank him that I was able to make it because one of those poor guys down there could have been me. And uh, at my age, I never dreamt I'd be coming back here. But I'm very thankful that I was, yeah. We've now moved to the edge of the camp and the building that we are looking at is called the depot. This would have been built around 1939, 1940, and uh, this was used by the SS to store, you know, civilian clothing and personal possessions of the inmates. Uh, also, their uniforms and shoes and eating utensils uh, would be stored here. And uh, yeah, once the the inmates got here to Buchenwald, well, they would leave the railway station. They would come through the camp gate. They would go through a disinfection building, and then they would come to the depot. And then from here, uh, a lot of them landed in a place called the Little Camp. And from there would be sent to different places uh, among the, the larger Buchenwald complex or one of the sub camps. Uh, one of the youngest, and this is just so sad to me, uh, one of the youngest to come through here was a four-year-old Jewish boy from Poland. And uh, he was hidden here by the political prisoners to protect him. We've moved into the interior of the depot now, and they've converted this building into a museum that tells the history of Buchenwald and uh, that shows some of the artifacts that came out of this place. So um, we're, we're a little short on time, but I'm going to, to do my best to show uh, a few of the things in this museum. Both of the commandants here at Buchenwald had photo albums made to kind of show some things about their time here and uh, yeah here are a few of those photo albums. This is the SS doctor here at Buchenwald. His name was Irvin Ding. Uh, so he was kind of in charge of a lot of the experimental stations and some of the labs in, in Block 50. Um, so yeah given what we've seen already definitely a, a terrible terrible human being. We talked earlier about the just vast number of Soviet prisoners who were brought here to Buchenwald and who were executed here. Uh, this is a zinc-lined cart that was built to basically transport the, the dead prisoners to the crematorium um, where, of course, they would be uh, cremated and then the, the remains quickly disposed of. Hmm. I've now moved outside of the perimeter of the concentration camp here. And what some people may not realize is that the usage of this camp did not end in April of 1945 when Americans liberated this camp. This area fell within the Soviet zone, so Americans had to withdraw. And when they did, the Soviets decided to take Buchenwald and put it to use for themselves. All right, we're going to take a little walk in the woods here. And as I mentioned, after the war, uh, from 1945 to 1950, uh, the Soviets formed Soviet Special Camp Number 2 here. So Buchenwald kind of just transitions right into uh, another camp under the Soviets. And and the the Soviets are not exactly known for 
their hospitality, uh, at least in regards to their enemies. Uh, the, the fighting on the Eastern Front between the Soviets and Germans was just as brutal as it gets. And um, anyway, not much was known about what happened to many of the German people who were interred here. Uh, but in the 90s, they started to dig a canal and they started digging up all of these bodies. Well, if you look at all of these metal poles, they each represent about four, five, six different bodies in this giant mass grave. Uh, all total, there are over 7,000 who died from malnourishment or lack of medical care or poor treatment and uh, basically were dumped in a mass grave right here below the camp. But yeah, when you see all these metal poles, and they just go on forever, it seems like, uh, those are representing the, the dead under the ground here. Hmm. If you would have been an inmate here at the Buchenwald concentration camp between 1937 and 1945, the, the reminder of death would have just been all around you at all times. But one structure here, looming over this camp, that would have been a constant reminder of the fate that could await you was up at the top of the hill at the crematorium. We're getting ready to go up to the crematorium but I wanted to show this real quick. Uh, this is called the just simply the pole in the wagon and it, it represents the brutal treatment of the prisoners here at Buchenwald and also the the forced labor uh, that they had to endure while they were here. Here before we get to the crematorium I wanted to show this as well. This is the remains of something that was known as the Goethe Oak. Uh, it was also called the Fat Oak. Uh, this was a lone oak tree that was left in the camp by the SS and, and served as kind of a, a symbol of, of strength and self-reliance for the inmates here. Uh, it ended up getting damaged and caught on fire during the bombing raid uh, in August of 44 and was subsequently cut down. Well here before us is the crematorium here at Buchenwald and to me this is another one of those enduring symbols of the Holocaust. It, it was at places like this where the Third Reich attempted to make the evidence of their crimes completely disappear. Now up until 1940 the SS had incinerated those who perished here at the camp in the crematorium in Weimar City but with the escalating number of dead here at the camp uh, well they ended up basically doing something more efficient and building a crematorium right here on the grounds which to, to the people who were here uh, just had to add to to the terror. Uh, now also here um, along here's the again the, the crematorium uh, there's a, a side wing that had a couple of pathology dissecting rooms here gold teeth would be extracted from the dead their organs would be removed for study and in really what I consider to be one of the darkest things to happen here at Buchenwald uh, human skin preferably tattooed was cut from the bodies and tanned and then worked into everyday objects and there's footage that exists of those things being put on display so that the horrors of what happened here could be made known to everyone. At the same time that the crematorium was built in 1940, uh, they also built this adjoining room. Uh, these are the pathological facilities, and uh, this is where postmortems would be performed. Um, so the, the examinations were done for producing records to really, to be honest, cover up the real causes of death. And as we enter into this room, you can see the, the table where 
this would occur. But there, there were some really awful and dark things that would happen in this room before the bodies were sent to the crematorium. Uh, gold teeth were extracted from the corpses. Um, they would also take you know, articles of like, you know, human skin. Uh, they also did shrunken heads here that would be distributed amongst the SS as, you know, these really kind of sick gifts. Um, but yeah, th so the, these pathological specimens um, were then used for different anatomical collections in the Third Reich. Just awful, again just to think about what people are capable of. Again, as we've mentioned, just mind-numbing to, to think of the evil that people are capable of. Here on the lower end of the crematorium is the uh, reconstructed execution installation. Uh, it's also known as the, the horse stable. It was a, a former horse stable that had been converted into a place where about 8,000 Soviet prisoners of war were executed. So the, the way that it would work, uh, Soviets started arriving here, you know, 19, late 1941 after the, the war in the East had started and uh, they would be brought into this room right here. Now, what they were told, they would be brought in here one at a time and told that they were coming in for a medical examination. And then they would be asked to stand right here to have their height measured. Okay, so if we look in here, again, they're thinking that they're just going through a routine medical examination. But what they didn't know, if you look right here, you can see there's a bit of a gap. On the other side would be an SS guard with a rifle who would shoot them right in the nape of the neck. Um, so this accomplished a couple of things. One, it allowed the Soviet prisoners to be executed in such a way that they didn't know what was happening and they wouldn't resist. And it also allowed these cowardly SS guards to uh, shoot these defenseless prisoners without having to look them in the eye. The room that we're looking at here is the mortuary. So there were two cellars where the, the dead would be collected. And if you look in here, well, these are all cremation urns that were discovered, uh, I believe, in 1997. So for, for a while, um, up until 1942, uh, it was possible for the relatives to get the cremated remains of the deceased. And then um, later after that, it only happened, you know, on a, on a limited basis. Um, after 1942, once you start getting Soviet prisoners here and the war is really cranked up, well, they would take the, the human remains or the, the ashes and just uh, dump them in low-lying areas here around the camp.
obviously we have now moved into the crematorium and these are the ovens that were used to incinerate the dead here at Buchenwald. So again, this is another one of those enduring symbols of the Holocaust. Now, as the uh, Allies started moving through and liberating these camps, uh, Eisenhower actually arranged for news reporters to come to places like Buchenwald. There were a lot of news reporters who came through here so they could report uh, on, on what had happened. Um, and he also had locals from the villages, so here it would have been Weimar, uh, come here to the camp and see firsthand what had been done in their name. And you, you can see film footage where these citizens are, are just horrified at what had been going on inside of the camps. Uh, they also brought U.S. soldiers in to bear witness to what had happened. And one of the men who was right here in this room uh, was Jack Moran of the 87th Infantry Division. Now, I, I remember we came in on a road from that direction, and this was the first building that we saw and, and entered. Right next to it was a, was a barracks with they had the, the stacked wooden shelves to put the prisoners on, and, and there were people still laying on some of those beds uh, but uh, they, they were just waiting to, waiting to be killed, and they knew it too, obviously. They knew that they were going to die. But uh, her talking about what they did in the basement is disgusting, where they cut out the, take out the gold out of the teeth and take out the organs and but, uh, just so, so sad, so sad. So you came, you were in this room though, weren't you? I'm what? You were in this room. Oh yes, oh yes, yeah. Yep. So what would you have to say to people who would deny that this ever happened? Well, bring them, bring them over here and, and, and show, them the, show them the evidence. Uh, uh, just, and and so, much, so much evidence, of course, proving that what they what the Germans did and, uh, they killed so many of our prisoners too that, that they captured Americans and, and made them go start on death marches back back into Germany and, and thousands of our prisoners died on those death marches and uh, look at the Malmedy massacre that killed 85 Americans just gunned them down in a field up there in Malmedy so no, they the, uh, the SS were, in fact, that was an SS operation at Malmody. And uh, they're just merciless people. It's the history, I studied the history of the German people back hundreds and hundreds of years, and they always were hard people, militaristic. Uh, uh, and this, uh, this, this is evidence of it right here and just hope that never happens again. It's had enough of it. On April 11th of 1945, the suffering of the people inside the fencing here at Buchenwald would finally come to an end when the men of the 6th Armored Division rolled up to the, the main gate of this camp. As a matter of fact, they got here right at 3.15 and to this day, if you look at the clock above the, the main gatehouse, well, it's set to 3.15 to uh, remember and honor those men of the 6th Armored Division. But uh, anyway, that was just a, a little bit here at Buchenwald. Pretty heavy experience and uh, pretty special to be able to come here with four of the men who helped to bring an end to the Third Reich.